Hello, welcome to Lower Master's Lair. I am your Lower Master, here today to continue our path through the various countries of the NSC region. Last time, we talked about an ancient lost kingdom. Today, we talk about another one, but one which has come and gone over various centuries, Osirian. But the control of all the non Mwegni area of Upper Grund, it has plenty of regional influence, not just locally, but across the entire region. So, getting started, let's look at the beginning. While we are going through ge geography and people today, we also have some history that we need to go through. So, where did Osirian start? It all began as a scattering of unrelated tribes. Here one man, Asgad I, met with a man named Nethys, a man who had one foot in mortality and one foot in godhood at the time. Around negative 3,470 AR. Using the god's power, Asgad I unified the tribes around the river, Sp river Sphinx, defeating the Sparna Ravagog, known as Runat, and building a city around the creature's corpse. We will go into more specifics when we talk about Nethys, whenever that actually happens. Intent. Either way, the civilization grew and eventually became rivals with the Jinska Imperium, resulting in years of conflict. Eventually, a ruler known as the Pharaoh of Forgotten Plagues Summoned Orimon and his divs, imprisoned the demonic carbringer Zelish Skara to work for him, and created the Ninth Plague, all which eventually brought the Imperium to its knees. The next pharaoh, the Song Pharaoh, ruled Assyrian at its greatest height, ruling from modern Raha Dome to the west and present day Geb to the south. Then, after the song fell, the kingdom rapidly began to decline, as corruption spread and pharaohs became more obsessed with the afterlife than their empires. This eventually led to the Pharaoh of No Rain, also known as Incorruptible Pharaoh, a lich who, lich who ruled for four centuries before being imprisoned. Then, after ages of corruption, Four pharaohs of different temperaments arose, one good, one evil, one lawful, one chaotic. And at first blush, they were obvious enemies, but they instead made an alliance where they would stand together, made a pact that they all refused to break, ruled together as a singular ruling body. And so, in negative 1498 AR, the second age of Assyrian arose, the age of the Black Sphinx. However, no sooner had the four died and reburied than the string of arrows fell once again to strings of decadence and corruption. Ev came to power in the far south, followed by Nex. The northern land rest of the Janeiro River was seeded, what is modern day Rahadom and Hulvia. This eventually led to callous traders leading a revolt, bringing the area under the control of the Padishah Empire of Kalish. In 1532 AR, where it would be a puppet of foreign powers for 3,000 years. In 4609 AR, Assyrians overthrew the Kalish sultans and established a priest of Avadar as Pharaoh Kermit I, the fourth bringer. He was followed by his son, Kermit II, the crocodile king, and then the current ruler, Kermit III, the ruby prince. With rising of anti-slave sentiment in the region, the ruby prince rewrote the rules on slavery, one that we will be talking about in just a moment. Further, to raise funds for the nation, he declared 
to, he decided to open the tombs of former pharaohs, allowing adventurers to take and sell treasure, as long as the government got a percentage. This practice was recently attempted to be stopped after it led to a long forgotten pharaoh resurrecting and attempting to bring destruction. However, at this point, because of the profits people have already made from treasure hunting in tombs, and the fact that it's in but tombs hidden in the clouds to the ground, all that this caused was too many business to become a black market. Now before we move on, let's look at our first side tangent. The parts of the show where the dead do not stay dead. Okay, mummies. And other mummy related topics. First, mummies are a type of undead that are hard to explain. Them being more than just an artificially created mummies buried in Osirian style tombs. However, with lack of any more accurate name, they are collectively referred to as mummies. Regardless whether it are from a desert, from the frigid north, or all bog bodies. As a loose classification, there are a few traits mummies tend to have in common. The first is that they tend to come from societies which believe that the physical state of one's body affects the state in the afterlife. Now, when it comes to battle, they have the power to use fear, dread, or similar emotions to paralyze their opponents, a ability usually only seen in incorporeal undead, and the disease slash curse known as mummy rot. This disease slash curse is called different names that take different forms. It usually has the same result. Breaking down the victim's body a similar form of decomposition, the mummy themselves would be victim too, until the victim's body is dust and slime. Now if history out of the way, Let's look at the people who live there. The first is the largest human ethnicity, the Gurundi. The Gurundi are the main human population in most of Gurund outside of the Muragni expanse. They kill most, most of those both along the Golden Road and in the impossible lands. All of this is an area that was once ruled by ancient Assyrian. So Assyrian is the best place to talk about them. These people are dark skinned and a head taller than most humans. They have two names, a given name and one that, which is one that tradition holds, is recycled from close family members, and their clan name which is used as their surname. They organize themselves into clans and either travel nomadically or establish vast empires. Some of the oldest civilizations that formed after Earthfall being by those of Grand ethnicity, including the Jinsk Imperium and the Shoi, Nex and Geb, and of course, Osirian. Because of their culture of travel, they hold hospitality in the highest of gods. Finally, the Gurundi are known for their history of arcane magic. Again, Nethys helped found Osirian, and there is hardly any arcane spell which does not trace their origin back to Gurundi. To the Gurundi. Another major population is dwarves. Recently, Pines released some information on two ethnicities of dwarves in the modern expanse. In one year, the only ethnicity of dwarf we really were given information on was Palmet dwarfs. These bronze skinned dwarfs have been found in every region the Osirian Empire has once ruled, but are most prominent in, of course, Osirian's, Osirian itself. These dwarfs live mostly in the Blazon Frontier region, but have many different complexes that either made out of vast necropolises, which are, they allow to become necropolises. These dwarfs' main purpose, as they claim, 
the mission given to them by their gods, to protect the bodies of worthy pharaohs. They tend to be isolationists, expect, except for those who have gained their respect, to those who have gained their respect. But they are known to be loyal. After all, they have been two keepers for millennia, millennia already. Why would they turn their backs on their allies at this point? In terms of other desert dwellers, there are a few, there's a fair minority of Hellish who still live in Osiria. The elves, the desert dwelling Brindi, can be found here as well as across all the deserts of the region. Gnomes can be found in large cities, and halflings are, were first recorded here. The highest end of the population, however, are that of Genikin. Binding of elementals to help with the ruling of the kingdom, being a long held practice of dynasties of old and of current. And a fair number of elementals called the area known as the Sphinx Co Scorpion Coast. Sphinx is the river. The Scorpion Coast is their home. It is said that the first genie can were purposely made by Grundy populations, using long lost rituals to purposely fuse themselves with elemental energy. Now before we move on, since we did talk about the Pomet and the Guardianship of the Dead, let's do a quick speed run of a side tangent, our second today, which we will use to look through some of the different Guardians of Tombs. First we have the Guardians known as the Living Monoliths. Sphinx is another Guardian, which we'll go into a little later, can divinely empower those who have Shown devotion to enable their bodies to become as steadfast as their will. In addition, there are Rubashki, animals, usually the pets of the owners of tombs, that were buried with the owners, and most common, the most common being a form of cat. These mummified animals patrol the area within the tomb. They are smaller size and decent speed allowing them to be an end to many tomb raiding parties. Finally, there are human groups. An example being that of the Ja Ipo, a former official but now vigilante group who arrests those who try to break into tombs. And also guard ground floors of many such tombs. Now before we go into the various regions, Let's look, quickly look at the government structure. Pharaoh, as stated, the current one being Druby Prince, is the central power structure of the nation. Under him, there are a variety of advisors who help him keep prepared on various different governmental problems. Some are elementals that the Pharaoh has made a pact with, some are human. These humans include the Council of Sun and Moon, first established at the beginning of the current dynasty, a council of representatives of local governments, merchants, clergy groups, minor nobles, and others chosen by the Ruby Prince. Five of these council seats are reserved for, from the Council of Liberated Slaves. This council, which was first created by the Ruby Prince himself, was made when he abolished her hereditary slavery and created strict rules under which a person could be sold into slavery. And it's made up of former slaves and children of slaves with the purpose to oversee the treatment of the slave pop population to try to make it so that even in slavery they leave, live decent lives. Finally, the military is under the prince's direct control, including his personal risen guard, bodyguards that are loyal to the throne even after death. Moving on to the actual regions of Assyrian, we start with the capital, Dothis. Dothis was founded around the fallen body of a spawn of Revagog. Because of the creature's death, 
splatterings of springs and oasis can be found in a nearby region. Not even taking into account that the site sits about 12 miles from the river Sphinx. The largest river in Garand and one of the largest rivers in the inner sea region, I should mention. It is the Crimson Canal which pulls water into the center of the city and it allows it to grow to the size that we know it as now. As one of the capitals of the entire NRC region, there are many landmarks which show the effects 8,000, 9,000 years have, and also recent events have both had on the city. The most prominent is the Black Dome, the shell of Olenot, which has been repurposed into the center of government. Malhita Bazaar is the center of the region's wealth and of slave trade, being a massive stop along the Golden Road. And as for places of worship, we have the Temple of the Eternal Sun, from a Kalish palace taken in over by Theren, Theren Ray priests, I don't know why words are hard for me, Theren Ray priests, the Necropolis of Faithful, a large tomb watched over by various Syrians, which I think is the name for worship of Erasma. I need to look that one actually up. And both the Temple of the All Seeing Eye and Asgard's Spire, some of the central places of worship, are Nethys. Outside of Sothis, we have the rest of the area along the Sphinx River, the area referred to as the Sphinx River Basin. Along the Sphinx River, many of the tribes of the region were able to establish civilizations, able to act using the annual flooding of the river to survive where other locations in the desert were not. Right around the riverbanks, one can see where the area gives way to the desert an undefined line where monsters usually do not cross. One of the most important points is close to where the Asp and Quirk rivers meet, where three cities have sprouted out. On, a city around which many of the temples of the dead were built, the locations keeping them from being buried in the sand for that long. Tipu, a city where we much papyrus is grown, and where many scribes are trained. And Wati, a city that was once ravaged by massive plagues, and now today has a part of the city set aside as a sacred ruin, consecrated in memory of the dead. And to the north, of, on the north side of the river, and the entire region, <laughs> is a major trade port of Utra. Its oceanic location be making it richer than Lotus itself at times. To the east, the edge of the basin, the Atari Ocean, with the Ass River flowing along the south, is the Scorpion Coast. This region is mostly untouched desert and jagged stone peaks. And of course, the place known as the Burning Coast, a place that when you look upon it at sunrise, seems to be lit ablaze. This region is mostly uninhabited. uninhabited. This region is mostly inhabited by tribes of elementals, each trying to vie for territory. However, despite this, some pharaohs have much preferred the isolation of the desert over the population centers around the riverbank, which eventually led to legendary four pharaohs of ascension to temporarily move the capital to the now abandoned city of Tomen. Speaking of the four pharaohs, this is also the location of their legendary Valley of the Pyramids. Four pyramids built along the deep cabins known as the Under Dunes, their purpose being to anchor the extra planar tomb of the four. 
going down south of the Asp at Cook Rivers, we have the Brazen Frontier. This region is mostly mountain ranges, the most prominent being the Brazen Peaks, where, which both rivers spring from before eventually being fed into the sinks. This region is mostly unpopulated, the main exceptions either being prominent cities or wandering nodal slavers. The landscape is mostly a maze of canyons and mountainsides, which makes it the perfect area to serve as the southern border with Katapesh. The largest city in the region, Ipak, is a large military base designed with the help of genius, though it does generate a decent amount of economic gain during times of peace. Going north of the Crook River, out of the safety of the Serpent River Basin, we have the Osirian Desert, a majority of the land which comprises Osirian. Surrounded by rivers on three sides, and the inner, o inner I was about to say inner ocean, not sure what's wrong with me this week, the inner sea to the north, the desert itself is an empty wasteland of costly shipping sands which leaves little landmarks of where one actually is. The desert tends to cycle between times of endless tombs devoted to various pharaohs, and times of them being buried beneath the sands, lost to time until another stray wind reveals them for future generations. However, scattered tribes still find their way to live around far off oases and a few major cities serve as waypoints for trade with the rest. However, there is one more resident of the Assyrian Desert which needs to be mentioned. Our third side tangent of the day, Sphinxes. Sphinx are five semi-related species of creatures with lions' bodies and eagles' wings. They hate being referred to as the same species, the single different species need to rely on the others to reproduce, so it is hard not to group the five together. Listing off the five, first we have animal sphinxes, those with male human heads, who are obsessed with philosophy and ethics. Genosphinxes, sphinxes, those with the heads of human females, are obsessed with knowledge and especially, as we know them, riddles. Female sphinxes are those with goat heads. They are, they are obsessed with treasure and anything which would allow them to mate with geno sphinxes. Heracle sphinxes have falcon heads and are the least intelligent of sphinxes, only being around human level. Tisk. and are known to hate everything. Finally are the Sano Sphinxes, particularly headed Sphinxes who have a thirst for secrets, hanging around graveyards and keeping their kills to wrath in order to learn secrets from the dead. All five prefer desert climates, being found all across the Golden Road, Ro Golden Road region. They tend to be solitary except for rare times for mating, and are able to survive eating only once a century. Because of their long lifespans, they tend to make perfect guardians to those who can tempt them to nest in a certain defendable location. But some believe many of the Sphinx statues across Osirian are actually Sphinxes who have petrified of time. Quite a region. It's technically a part of the Osirian Desert, but it is vastly different from the rest. Footprint of Ravagug. It stands as a bare land instead of a desert, with two large volcanoes and various hot springs, lacking greenery and populated by savage flying beasts. This altogether makes the footprint the harshest territory within Osiria. Despite this, many pharaohs have tried building their tombs in the area, 
looked to have made of them destroyed by earthquakes and volcanic ash. However, there is an area open to many elemental planes. And various groups of aesthetic monks, like those of Tarquata Monastery, use this as their home. And, of course, various cults make this dangerous region their home. Most prominent being the shrine known as La Marche to Flower, where a large cult of gnolls and royal hyenas capture traders traveling along the Syrian desert and offering them on their curse and orgy-filled altars. Now moving on to the next, let's look at religion. The four modern re religions which are followed in Assyrian are Nathus, Avadar, Thernwe, and Phrasma. Nathus needs an explanation. He played a heavy hand in the foundation of of the country right before his full rise to godhood. Thanray is another no-brainer. Being under control of the Kellish for millennia and having the cult of Dawnflower help with your revolution will give them a decent reputation in the country. In a culture so obsessed with death and having so many necropolises, Erasma is a third no-brainer. Finally, as mentioned, the founder of the newest age of Assyrian was a priest of Abaddon, and the god of civilization still has a decent presence among the civilians. And going through gods, we of course cannot fail to mention our final side tangent for the day, the Assyrian gods. These are the native gods of Assyrian, worshipped in the area for millennia. When the Kelish conquered Assyrian, they tried suppressing the worship of the savage gods, and the belief of these deities became minor, causing the deities to focus on a small kingdom across the universe from Galarian, the kingdom of Comet, which fun fact is the original name of the what we now know as the Egyptian dynasty, ancient, Egypt, ancient Egyptian dynasty. So, the reference to our world. However, they still have some presence in the area, and in a large number, and all of a larger number than just the 20 that were able to be fit in the back of the empty graves book of the Mummy's Mask Adventure Path. I don't have this to discuss all the gods, and we'll probably wait for a day when Hope Against Hope, we get individual write-ups for each of them. But let's go through some quick notes. The most popular god, the most popular gods of the region, are of course Osiris himself, the god of the dead. Capri, the god of labors and is popular among the common man. Wajit, the personification of the river Sphinx itself. And on the evil side, a pep. The Vower of the Dawn. For non human go gods, player characters might be interested in. Bastet, the goddess of cats and pleasure, is popular among cat folk, especially the Dredderdredderdredding Shemtej ethnicity. And two gods are interpreted as dwarfs. Yes, the god of protection. And Ptah, the god of craftsmanship and metalworking. Finally, outside of character options you might be interested in, there are four goddesses which are said to be protectors of the counterfeit jaws, the jaws which hold the organs of those who are mummified. These are Isis, the goddess of magic and protector of the liver. Neith, goddess of hunting and protector of the stomach. Nethys, not that one, goddess of mourning and protector of the lungs, and Selket, goddess of scorpions and protector of the intestines. Which brings us to the end of today's video. 
However, it does not crank this to the end of a serial. If you have been paying attention, you might have a guess on who we are talking about next week. But regardless, I hope to see you next week when we talk about another god. I wonder who it could possibly be. See you then.